just ahead on Washington to Washington. It isn't a luxury. It's now a necessity, like water and electricity. Calls from the nation's capital to expand broadband access to every American after the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the digital divide. But where to start? We've had a truly distorted picture of broadband availability in the United States. The challenges to expanding service and making sure everyone can afford it. It's an ongoing problem, right? Because every month you have to have the resources to buy again. Meanwhile, across the country. We're chasing federal money like crazy. Washington State's broadband office is gearing up and getting ready for an influx of dollars for broadband with an ambitious goal. It's the most compelling uh, broadband goal in the country. You know, it's 150 megabits symmetrical to everybody in the state by 2028. That's fast, but how to reach it? One size doesn't fit all. One tool to provide service doesn't fit all. It will take money to go the last mile in remote towns. Urban areas lack connection for a different reason. It's still not affordable, right? We actually don't even have a definition of what affordable broadband or internet is. In some areas, everybody needs good broadband. The difference in speed can depend on what side of the interstate you live on. We're getting like dial up speed internet real bad. I don't see how they're existing. From the capital of Washington State to the capital of the United States, this is Washington to Washington. Hello and welcome to Washington to Washington. I'm Jennifer Huntley in Washington State. And I'm Tammy Thuringer in Washington, D.C. The COVID pandemic forced people to work and learn from home. Those months online highlighting what many have known for years. The lack of affordable and reliable broadband across the country has caused a digital divide. It isn't a luxury. It's now a necessity, like water and electricity. One of President Biden's infrastructure goals is to bring affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband to every American. Both Democrat and Republican lawmakers in Congress agree broadband is a critical infrastructure. But the current network is riddled with gaps in availability. This has created effectively what's known as a digital divide not just across the country, but actually from community to community. According to the Federal Communications Commission, more than 14 million homes don't have access to high-speed internet. Adi Tomer with the Brookings Institute says the actual number is likely much worse. FCC regulations have meant that we've had a truly distorted picture of broadband availability in the United States. That's because of a quirk in the current FCC mapping data. The FCC considers a census tract served by broadband, even if only one household in that entire area has access. We had the impression as a working public that broadband networks went to so many more neighbors than they actually did. But access isn't just about where broadband goes. It's also how fast it is. The most current FCC data shows about two-thirds of Americans live in an area where providers offer broadband speeds. Broadband or high-speed internet is defined as the ability to download 25 megabits of data per second and upload at least 3 megabits per second. Those without the 25-3 speed are considered unserved. Unserved is probably the brightest line one can draw, right? It's basically they lack service at this level of service. The FCC adopted the current speed standard in 2015, and there have been calls to increase it. Mike Romano with the Rural Broadband Association says getting high-speed internet as currently defined to the unserved population should come first. The pandemic's obviously highlighted again a greater demand on upload capability, upstream capability as well. So that's where we say perhaps we can target money to those areas that are lacking 25.3. And then once we've addressed all those, we can move up the stack to 50 over 5 or 100 over 10. But to get access to unserved areas, better information is needed about where they are. Last year, Congress passed the Broadband Data Act. The legislation requires the FCC to collect updated data from Internet providers about where they offer broadband service and create new, accurate maps on the granular level. In February, FCC Acting Chair Jessica Rosenworcel announced a new task force would work to collect the data for the maps. Tomer says the maps will be key. It is very easy with broadband dollars, just like other infrastructure sectors, to see huge amounts, right? We're talking billions here. Other sectors of the economy wish they had that much from the public sector, but it's also really expensive projects. It's really easy to see that those numbers quickly dwindle based on a few highly expensive projects. 
And it's really important that we prioritize those communities that are most in need. And this is where the improvements in broadband mapping data really help. The new FCC maps likely won't be available until next year, but we're already getting a better look at the country's current state of broadband. In June, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, an agency of the U.S. Department of Commerce, unveiled a new mapping tool. The first of its kind, the Indicators of Broadband Need Map, was developed using public and private sources, including data sets from Microsoft. The new mapping tool is different from the FCC's current map because it includes data at the census block level, not just an entire tract. That means a more accurate picture of where broadband exists and where it doesn't. The map also includes on-the-ground speed test information. That data shows even in many areas where providers offer broadband, the speed falls below the 25-3 standard. The Biden administration says the new NTIA mapping tool won't replace the FCC maps and won't be used to direct federal funding from an infrastructure package. Jennifer, what do broadband expansion efforts look like there in Washington state? Tammy, Washington state has one of the most aggressive goals in the country when it comes to broadband expansion. They want high-speed internet everywhere, and they want it fast. Leading the charge is Russ Elliott, the state's first director of broadband. That's broadband before broadband was cool, right? Russ Elliott has been working on internet access for more than two decades. From the private sector in Colorado to the public sector in Wyoming, and now in Washington. Elliott's goal has always been to get as many people connected as he can. I've always been a very much infrastructure-based focused guy. I'm like, I'm trying to get that fiber to the home and then run away and get fiber to the next home and fiber, fiber, fiber. Now his job is to help the state meet that ambitious goal of getting everyone connected to high-speed internet over the next seven years. It's the most compelling uh, broadband uh, goal in the country. You know, it's 150 megabits symmetrical to everybody in the state by 2028. And it's going to cost a lot of money. Yeah, it is. The state's initial cost estimate came in somewhere between three and a half to four and a half billion dollars. Initially, that kind of money seemed out of reach. But then a worldwide pandemic changed the way we all view and value high-speed internet in our homes. So prior to COVID in the state of Washington, I was kind of the wallflower at the dance. We'd go talk about broadband, I was competing with everything. And then, and then the pandemic hits and now all of a sudden I'm prom king, right? Both federal and state lawmakers, along with President Biden, are prioritizing broadband this year. While details are still being worked out in D.C., states stand to gain billions in broadband infrastructure funds from the federal government, if Congress can agree. We've had in the past, we've had these financial limitations. It's always been money and, and we don't have the capital and we can't get it done. But uh, I, I contend it's time to rethink that. You know, we're going to have those, those capital dollars. It still isn't clear what formula Congress will use to divvy up the funds to states, but Elliott estimates Washington state could get about 2% of any federal money to expand infrastructure. He says part of the reason Washington should easily get money is because the state is prepared to spend it fast. We've got projects ready. We've got shovel projects in the, in the hopper. We've got a map that identifies areas that are uh, unserved and, and areas of need. Uh, we're prepared to, to give you projects that you can fund. One main focus that makes Washington stand apart from other states is the work the state has already put into mapping areas without broadband. Information Elliott says is critical to solving access issues. Until we define the problem more, more clearly, we can't make good decisions. That means 32 broadband action teams from cities and towns statewide have worked to update FCC maps in order to get an accurate picture of where broadband connectivity falls short. We're measuring down to the door the front door, where federal maps were measuring blocks and, and shape files and different types of entities. With more accurate maps of unserved communities and a renewed financial commitment from state and federal officials, Elliott feels confident that Washington State will reach its goal by 2028. Do you ever think about the fact that 100 years ago we might have been talking about getting electricity to rural America and now it's broadband? Yeah, it's fun to have that conversation and, and talk about that. And one of the compelling takeaways from that conversation is, as in Wyoming, we were talking a lot to some of those rural electric cooperatives. And, and uh, a lot of the stories you'd hear about is that when electricity was coming and it was starting to happen, a lot of communities were saying, you know, we don't need that newfangled technology. You know, we're just fine on oil and gas. In the end, what happened was those communities that were late to adopt actually were communities that went away. You know, so I, I think that's the one lesson we can take from electrification of the country is, is 
let's not sit back and pretend like this isn't something that's important. We, we need to make certain we do talk about this as critical infrastructure and as a way to maintain the economic viability and existence here into the future. So where is broadband connectivity most lacking? In areas of rural Washington, the problem is tied mostly to what's known as the last mile, landscapes with very few homes that make fiber line investment costly for telecommunications companies. But as we found out visiting Southwest Washington, connectivity even in small towns and cities is more complicated than you might think. It's kind of a necessity at this point. We're getting like dial up speed internet, it's real bad. Jacob Hampton is a barber in the tiny town of Winlock, just off I-5 in Lewis County. The barber and his daughter is the place to get haircuts in the heart of downtown. People swarm the shop on weekends, lining up for a cut and conversation. Yeah. But this hotspot doesn't have what you expect out of most places in the 21st century, internet. We used to have CenturyLink in the barber shop, but it was expensive, it was slow, and we ended up just getting rid of it. We all have our cell phones, we can hotspot if we need to, so it's not worth the money. How do you run a business without payment, without internet? I use Square Pay a lot, so I have like the little uh, the phone bit plugs in, and I run a card. That's uh, the only way I can do card transactions, because we just don't keep a computer, don't keep internet. Got to use your phone. Got to use your phone. Jacob's home, while connected to internet, doesn't have the high-speed broadband that for so many is a necessity these days. A single dad of two says the pandemic made their internet situation even more frustrating. His daughter is quadriplegic and nonverbal, and her virtual doctor's appointments kept dropping the connection. Online schooling was also a headache. It was constant problems, and the school ended up issuing out the kids um, Verizon hotspots because it, it was better than the internet that we have in the ground. So it's kind of a crazy thing. I just don't think Toledo would have ever been on the map for us if broadband wasn't just available. To every but less than 10 miles away, across the freeway and across a digital divide sits Toledo, another small town in southwest Washington. I know, right? <laughs> where Cindy Samko and Eric Hayes enjoy high-speed broadband internet. We were looking for internet, and I found an article that said top five internet in the country in Toledo, Washington was listed, and I had to Google where Toledo was. The couple both work as mobile app developers and need broadband for their jobs. They moved from Portland more than two years ago, specifically looking for a small town feel with a big city connection. I said, Cindy, we should go look at Toledo. And she goes, where's that? And I pointed on the map and she goes, way up there. <laughs> and uh, we drove up here and pretty much that was it. <laughs> There's a lot of people building new houses and moving here just because of the fiber. Dale Merton is the vice president of Toledo Tel, the company that provides high-speed internet in town. But despite their name, they aren't just limited to Toledo. We actually can go anywhere we want. We've had that authority for decades, but it just takes money. Money to pay for the fiber line infrastructure. Merton says it would take the company a long time to recoup those costs. It's extremely expensive to build fiber. It's about $12,000 a location. You know, at $54.95 a month or $75.95 a month, that's, that's a number of years before we even break even on, on the build out. Two bills the legislature passed this year give public utility districts and ports new authority and public grant money to offer broadband internet. But private companies can apply for those grants. While large telecommunications companies typically won't invest in fiber infrastructure in remote places where the return on investment is low, Merton says Toledo Tel would. Absolutely. If I could get access to those funds, I would start building in Winlock today. We have private providers who have worked really hard across the state to provide service. Senator Shelley Short supported the Senate bill that allows PUDs to offer broadband to people who live in areas that lack any access to internet. I supported Senate Bill 5383 because I feel like it did the same thing, but it was a targeted um, kind of first step approach to allowing a PUD or a port to serve an unserved community. Short understands the challenges of internet speed in rural communities. The Senate Republican floor leader struggles with high speed at her own home in far northeastern Washington. I know you had to be in Olympia as a floor leader, but could you have done a remote session 
from your district easily? No, actually not easily at all. I mean, on a good day, I don't even get the what they consider the minimum broadband connectivity of 25.3. And the biggest challenge that I saw, it works well at times, um, but that's if I'm the only one using it. But she is hopeful the federal government and the state will work together to allocate money where it is needed most. We know that we have an opportunity to use significant investment at both the federal and state level. And what you wanna do is use it where it's needed. And what you don't wanna do is have that funding going to, to people who already have it. Back at the barbershop, Jacob Hampton often hears from customers from Toledo who boast of their high-speed internet. Well, it started a few arguments in the shop. He hopes someday he will be able to do the same. But if the solutions being discussed now don't deliver fiber to his town, he's open to looking toward the sky and Starlink, the new satellite internet from SpaceX. We see the satellites going over every night. So people are just waiting. A lot of people are on the waiting list. You can get involved in helping the state broadband office map broadband connectivity. A one minute access and speed survey is available on their website. Just go to commerce.wa.gov and click on the Building Infrastructure tab at the top of the page to find the broadband office. Once there, you can share how internet is in your area. Tammy? Thanks, Jennifer. Service is one part of broadband access, but affordability and having the tools to use it are also important. Still ahead, we'll look at how those three issues are contributing to the digital divide in both rural and urban areas across the country and what's being done to help close the gap. Welcome back to Washington to Washington. With remote homes and sparse populations, rural communities might come to mind when thinking about those lacking broadband. But both urban and rural areas are being affected by the digital divide. There are some areas that are tremendously well served, but there are a lot of other parts of rural America that are lacking access to sufficient or robust broadband. It's areas lacking broadband service Mike Romano would like to see helped first. Let's start with everybody who's lacking even basic 25-3 broadband. Try to get as many, if not everyone in that category served and get them better broadband, better networks. And then let's turn, once we've done that, if there's funding left, to the next tier of service and say, okay, this is the new unserved. And we're going to serve that. We're going to use all the funding we can in the bucket that's left to do that. And then if that gets all served and we still have funding left over, turn to the next level. The Rural Broadband Association represents 850 small providers, including Toledo Tel in Washington state. The association's providers service an average of 5,000 customers, or about seven people per square mile. Adi Tomer says lower density population areas mean the cost to install physical broadband infrastructure is often higher. The smaller towns or even fairly large sized dense cities but are relatively isolated, it can be more expensive to really build out both wireline and even mobile wireless telecommunications. Tomer says that's contributed to the current network service gaps. Broadband flourishes in neighborhoods where internet service providers have the opportunity to reach many households in the same location. It effectively means that every time they build out a wireline segment or a cell tower, they can have more potential customers connecting to it. But it, those economics only work out if customers will actually subscribe. That has created an incentive-driven marketplace across the United States where internet service providers have prioritized going to the communities with the highest earning potential. But a lack of physical broadband infrastructure has also led to service gaps in places with large populations. In denser urban areas, many of them with lower incomes, lower educational attainment, we see that in fact, internet service providers have skipped over those neighborhoods, which they are legally permitted to do so. It's called digital redlining. And the practice has resulted in broadband providers investing less in low-income and minority communities. A recent Pew Research poll found 65 percent of Hispanics and 71 percent of Blacks in the U.S. are likely to have access to broadband at home compared to 80 percent of whites. Because the FCC data effectively hides the amount of digital redlining happening, we don't know which neighborhoods are suffering the most. We don't know exactly why it's even happening there, whether it's purposeful on the part of internet service providers or, in fact, you know, it, it wasn't a purposeful decision. There were other reasons. The new Indicators of Broadband Need Map tool is helping answer some of those questions. 
With just a few clicks, users can see where the high poverty areas in purple overlap with the areas lacking broadband service in red. To help address the issue, the Biden administration proposed prioritizing community-built networks, those owned, operated by, or affiliated with local governments, nonprofits, and cooperatives when distributing infrastructure package funds. Historically, the government has subsidized the building of broadband networks by offering incentives to large private companies like Verizon, Comcast, and AT&T. It's still unknown who will receive infrastructure funding to expand broadband service, but Romano says there's a better way to decide. Rather than a preference for you know, specific types of corporate entities or, or you know, governmental entities alone, that essentially what you'll see is a, a, a preference instead for folks who have shown a track record of delivering service in rural areas, whether they're privately owned, publicly owned, cooperatively organized, or what have you, but have a track record of community investment and reinvestment in these areas. Increasing availability in unserved areas doesn't mean the people living in those communities will be able to afford the service or have the tools to use it. The United States, relatively speaking, has some of the most expensive broadband subscription services among any of our developed world peers. According to the Pew Research Center, 45 percent of non-broadband users say they don't have high-speed internet at home because the cost of a subscription is too expensive. It's a fight that continues. I mean, it's an ongoing problem, right, because every month you have to have the resources to buy again. Congress has approved millions of dollars during the pandemic to help cover some of the cost of broadband services through relief packages in various programs like the Emergency Broadband Benefit. The program gives low-income households up to $50 per month and $75 to those on tribal land to help cover broadband expenses. But the $3.2 billion program is only in place until the funding runs out. Tomer says a more permanent solution to the sometimes prohibitive cost of high-speed service is critical. We're going to need to think about a structure here that continues to allow private sector to invest and innovate um, around new networks and, of course, continues to make a profit, but also that gets every single person online at the speeds we need. But even then, increased availability and affordable monthly service won't matter if people don't have the tools to use it. It means more than just a subscription service. Devices like computers or tablets can also be a barrier to people being able to actually adopt digital services. The new NTIA data also shows where there's a lack of homes with devices. For example, the data found multiple census tracts in Washington state where homes without a computer, smartphone, or tablet reach into the double digits. The emergency broadband benefit also gives eligible homes a one-time discount of up to $100 to purchase a laptop, desktop computer, or tablet. But again, that's just a temporary solution to an ongoing issue. We're going to need to think about what's a modern um, system that works so American can continue to be competitive in the digital age. The FCC launched the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program in May. More than 2 million homes signed up in just the first few weeks. You can find out more about the program and see if you're eligible by going to FCC.gov slash broadband benefit. Tammy, in a state where Amazon and Microsoft have headquarters, you'd expect that cities here would be hardwired for high-speed Internet. While that may be the case, the story in urban areas in Washington state is one of affordability. Working families living in the shadow of high tech, but disconnected from the community surrounding them. It has been very difficult for us. Sylvia Seluma Mejia Ulloa is a mother of three in Burien, Washington. She has a kindergartner and a first grader who attend the Highline School District. When the pandemic began and the school district went online, the internet in her apartment was spotty at best. The kids were on me like, Mom, I cannot go into the class. Mom, this is frozen, like, you know, it's freezing so much, like, you know, all the time. After getting a hotspot from the district for one of her child's tablets, she needed to use her cell phone for the other. Because I would get phone calls often to say why the kids are not in class, you know, what, why, what's going on. Finally, she received free Wi-Fi from the school district and Comcast, but a previous renter at her apartment owed money, so she couldn't get it right away. A letter from the school's principal finally sorted it out with Comcast, but it took quite some time before the kids were able to reliably be online for class. The need for internet specifically was very high. 
Rosa Manriquez is one of the district's family engagement specialists. She says Sylvia's story is all too common, even though Burien is just miles from Seattle, one of the tech capitals of the world. With not having the internet, that was a big struggle for the children, for the teachers, for everyone involved. While high-speed internet exists in cities and suburban towns, access in urban areas comes down to cost. About 50% of constituents here in the 33rd Legislative District, especially if you're a working um, middle income or low income family, family with children or on a fixed income, you're about 50% less likely to be on the internet. State Representative Mia Gregerson says in her district, access to the internet means more than just laying fiber lines. Digital equity means access to high speed, devices to use, and skills to actually know how to use them. According to one study, more than a million Washingtonians do not have access at home or rely on inadequate service. When the pandemic hit, my mind says that we have to be really mindful in this space around the statewide approach. Gregerson joined leaders from a variety of industries to form an internet access crisis team. Every week we listen to someone come to talk to us about uh, special interest, um, where we sort of peeled back the onion to understand really who's being affected, whether it's elders who are facing social isolation, whether it's um, uh, children with dis de developmental disabilities who didn't have the appropriate devices, or the professional educators. The crisis team worked with entities all over Washington state, setting up drive through hotspots, getting the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction and the Governor's Office to donate devices to students, and offering much needed training for teachers online. The reality is, is it felt very lonely because you knew that people were suffering everywhere, quietly in their home, and that if we didn't figure this out, that we would lose touch with people every day because they couldn't afford to keep their internet also. Part of being able to solve affordability issues is understanding exactly how much high-speed internet should cost. We actually don't even have a definition of what affordable broadband or internet is. While we have goals for speeds, we don't have affordability uh, metrics. There is also a logistical puzzle in dealing with private companies, the federal government, and local cities and towns. Here, low-income plans were available, but oftentimes you had to stop one plan and get on another, or if you were potentially um, past due on a plan, you couldn't qualify for some of these low-income plans. So um, it's a lot of problem solving, a lot of navigation of the system to find out how to help them uh, get connected. Gregerson is hopeful that federal and state funding will help expand options and keep people online. But she wonders about programs like the Federal Emergency Broadband Benefit, which provides a temporary discount on monthly internet bills for low-income households. When the program launched in May, the website crashed, showing the need is there. But what happens when the money runs out? The reality is that we're just helping to shepherd that conversation because it's directly with the providers, and the providers are still private companies. So how does government work in partnership with providers without having any type of framework? And so I think now is that moment in time to really ask ourselves, how long can we continue to work with asking providers to provide these services that are so critical, like water um, and air, <laughs> uh, without having sort of that framework of it being as close to a utility as possible? As new legislation pushes for broadband infrastructure and lawmakers on both sides prioritize what gets funded, there is common agreement on one point. As the country begins to come back to life after the pandemic, despite more in-person meetings, the demand for reliable and affordable broadband isn't going away. That's right, Jennifer. Now the challenge is to make sure no one is left behind. Thank you for joining us for Washington to Washington. We look forward to continuing our focus on the critical issues in this state. And talking with the people in both places who are working towards solutions. We welcome your feedback on this episode as well as ideas for future episodes of Washington to Washington. Connect with us on social media at Watawa and share your thoughts. For now, from Washington, D.C., thank you for watching. And from Washington State, we hope you'll join us next time on Washington to Washington.